Shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's Sabbath service. We're going to start off by reading a scripture, and this scripture can be found in 3 Nephi 737b RAV and 1612b in the LPV. And for those that are new to this, RAV is what the RLDS Church or Community of Christ, the, that, that branch of our shared faith, uses. And OPV is what the Brighamite Church is, that, that branch of our shared faith, what they use. I'll remember my covenant unto you, O house of Israel, and ye shall come into the knowledge of the fullness of my gospel. Now, as far as prayer requests this week, I once again feel impressed by the Spirit to ask you to pray for those that are seeking the gospel, those that have found the fellowship and are learning more about it, and those that are looking for something, and I'm going to be talking about this in my message today, but for those that are seeking the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and have not been able to find a place, they're spiritually homeless, please pray for those people today. I haven't had a lot of contact with people. There's some people that are going through some spiritual things or trying to figure out what to do in their, their religious life. And I would ask that you pray for these brothers and sisters. I sure that there are people out there that are sick and afflicted so please definitely pray for the sick and afflicted i i feel very fortunate that i haven't been talking to anyone recently that's had covid or that is sick but i know that there are still saints out there that are so let's remember them in our prayers and let's also make sure that we, as we pray we are thankful for all the blessings that we have received you know here in, in these services i've asked you to pray for brothers and sisters that needed jobs, whether it was because they were unemployed or because they needed a better working condition or a better environment or more money or whatever it was. Um, and these, these people were blessed. They were able to find work. People that are feeling lost have found spiritual homes. So the Lord is answering our prayers. So we need to remember as we're praying to Thank God for the blessings that he has bestowed upon us. And now for the unity portion of the service, I'm going to read this Shema both in Hebrew and in English, and then I'm going to pause to allow time for you, the congregation, to read it back. Shema Yisrael, Yiva Elohenu, Yiva Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yavah is our Elohim. Yavah is unity. For those of you who watch these videos regularly, you may remember a few weeks back on a Thursday thought. The Thursday thought I shared with you was a new direction for the fellowship moving forward. Christine and I had spoken and we had discussed some things and I shared our conversation with you and talked about how we were gonna move forward in Christ as the fellowship of Christ. And I know that these Sabbath services are non-denominational and, and, and I know this, what I'm talking about, this topic I'm about to go over is a little bit more focused on the fellowship of Christ so I'm hoping you'll bear with me this week and you'll be able to take the things that I say in a non-denominational way, because even though we are a non-denominational church, if you will, and I use that term lightly in the modern sense, and even though we are a ecumenical movement for sure, we are still an organization. We still have things to do and things that need to be done, and there are changes being made. And Christine and I had a conversation last night and we were going over the scriptures I'm going to read to you today. And, and I really felt impressed by the spirit to talk to you about these things. And I want you to keep that spirit of ecumenicalism in your mind as I discuss today's topic. Because everything I'm, I'm trying to say here, I'm hoping I come across right. I'm hoping that we can speak spirit to spirit. But everything I'm going to try to say today is going to be about the greater Latter-day Saint movement and in our part individually and collectively in it. Last night, Christine and I were reading in the Book of Mormon, and I'm gonna start in 
chapter 7, verse 34, REV, chapter 16, verse 10A, OPV. And it says, And thus commandeth the Father, that I, Jesus Christ, should say unto you, At that day when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, and, be, and shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts above all nations, and above all the people of the whole earth, and shall be filled with all manners of lyings, and deceits, and of mischiefs, and all manner of hypocrisy, and murders, and priestcrafts, and whoredoms, and secret combinations. And if they shall do all these things, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. So I want to pause there for a minute. I have spoke to so many people from so many different Latter-day Saint denominations. And I can tell you that while I love every branch of our faith and I love the Latter-day Saint movement, it is a difficult movement to be a part of, especially hearing the stories that people share with me about their testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the battle that they have in themselves between the reality of the churches versus the teachings of the scriptures and the Holy Spirit. And that's why a lot of these people are leaving these churches, at least the ones I'm coming in contact with. If we look at this, it says, the day when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel. You can't really sin against something unless you are actively knowing what you're doing. So I wouldn't consider this to be, let's say, like anti-Mormon literature, right? Um, I, I do know that some of those people are just repeating things, lies that other people have said, and others are genuinely trying to share something they believe is true. But at the end of the day, they don't have the fullness of the gospel and they never had it because they reject the Book of Mormon. So we can't be talking about our Protestant or Catholic brothers and sisters or really any other religion. The only people that we're aware of with the fullness of the gospel are the Latter-day Saints. And that means every sect that's out there. So this is a prophecy written long before the Book of Mormon was written, obviously, translated into English through divination before any kind of Latter-day Saint church was organized, or even before the Lord gave Joseph Smith the name of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, these Gentiles here, in my mind, must be those who are Latter-day Saints, but are not Israel. And I'm trying to be very careful here, because I do not want to divide us into this us versus them nonsense. I do not like that. I want to read these scriptures and I want to try to express my thoughts on them in a way that can, instead of being us versus them, is us and us. Because none of us are perfect. So there's going to be a day when the Gentiles shall sin against the gospel and reject the fullness of the gospel and be lifted up in the pride of their hearts above all nations and above all the people of all the earth. Now. I can only speak from my own background. I came from the Salt Lake City Church, so I have a Brighamite background. And I can tell you that one of the problems I had when I was in that church was I felt like I was being stopped by the church I belonged to from practicing my religion, from practicing Mormonism. I, I felt like this fullness was rejected because they claimed to have prophets, but there were no prophecies. They claimed to have revelators, but there was no revelations. They claimed to have seers, but they weren't seeing anything. One of my greatest complaints of that church was the fact, I, I tell this more because it's funny, but a guy asked me one time, we had a really good conversation about that particular church when I belong to it. And he says, is there anything that makes you uncomfortable about it? And I thought about it for a second. And I, an I answered, ugh, excuse me. I answered him honestly. And I said, yeah, I don't understand why it is that we are led by prophets, seers and revelators, but our parking lots are always too small. And I was being very genuine. There were times when I actually had to go home because I wasn't going to walk four blocks to go to church. I, I 
just was, hey, you know, if you guys really have the foresight as prophets, Brigham Young knew to make the streets wide enough, you don't know how to make your parking lot big enough for three different congregations. You you did not plan this very well when you when you did this. So, and yes, I, I should have swallowed my pride. I should have walked to church. That is my bad. Uh, but in all seriousness, I, I really understood why it was that these people, they're supposed to, you know, they're elevated so high but they were unable to do the things that we were taught they were called to do. It, it always just bothered me. And when I looked and read the literature, the lines and deceit that I found there, because I could see the history and I could see how it was being whitewashed, how it was being rewritten to sound innocent when it wasn't. Mischiefs, hypocrisy, murders, yeah, I mean, Brigham Young actually had something in his in his version of the temple rituals that said it was it was a murder oath that you would pray for the deaths of those that killed the prophets. And you know, vengeance is supposed to be mine, saith the Lord, not ours. And so that never did strike me as a very Christian or Mormon idea or practice. And there were a lot of Mormon murders. It wasn't just the Mountain uh, Mountain Meadows massacre. Uh, from what I understand, Brigham Young had his hand in a lot of people being executed, killed, bullied, chased out of town, and even bragged about it because of the fact that he wanted to be in charge. And I would consider that priestcraft. And I will tell you, there were men that I did not sustain in their callings because they had confessed priestcraft to me. I'm not going to get into that right now. But they, they were in positions of power that we're practicing priestcraft and by priestcraft i will just say i mean um improper dominion over other people particularly women stating that women shouldn't be allowed to think for themselves or have any thoughts or ideas they merely existed to do what men told them to do that is just heinous in my opinion and then the other two on here are whoredoms and secret combinations. Keep in mind that whoredoms can also be apostasies. Uh, and, I, and I hate using that term, but those that are teaching things that are going against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in my mind, the greatest ap apostasy or whoredom, if you will, of the Latter-day Saint movement is every single church saying, it's us, we're the real true church. We're the ones Joseph Smith founded. Everybody else is a liar. Everybody else is apostate. To me, that that is... Yeah, very unchristlike. It goes against what Mark, what Jesus taught in uh, Mark nine, I believe it's thirty eight through forty one. It goes against what Mormon taught in the Book of Moroni, chapter seven. And the secret abominations. Everybody, not everybody. So many churches doing things, and and whispering. And again, I can only speak for the Brighamites, and I feel just horrible even just talking about this. I, I don't like talking about it. I would always hear these things. Well, it's come down from Salt Lake. What, where? Is it in the Enzyme? It's come down from Salt Lake. Oh, was there an official church announcement? All these different secrets. And then later on, you know, they were all just cultural myths. Some of them were innocent. You have to wear a white shirt to pass the sacrament. Some of them are dangerous. If you have dark skin, you're less worthy than white people. Now, again, I, I don't mean to speak ill of my brothers and sisters in the Brighamite sex. I know that there are a lot of good people in these churches. I'm merely sharing with you my experiences that lead me to believe when I'm reading this that this has to be talking about the Latter-day Saints. And I can tell you that from talking to others from other Latter-day Saint movements, they've shared similar stories not not with the same grievances I just mentioned, but other signs that lead to what Jesus is talking about here. This idea that the Latter-day Saints are somehow better than everybody else, rising their hearts above all nations and above all the people of the whole earth. There are Latter-day Saint denominations with just a handful of people that think that everyone else is going to hell, that only they have the truth. And that, I mean, 
if you could feel what I'm feeling right now, these ideas, they hurt me. Could you imagine having so much pride and so much egoism that you believe in a God that's going to damn billions and billions of people to hell and it's just going to be the six of you in heaven? I, I can't even fathom that idea. It doesn't make sense. And so in verse 37, it says, if they shall do all these things, they shall reject the fullness of my gospel. Now, that doesn't mean that they're wicked, evil people that are all doomed to hell. So please don't take this that way. This just means that they only have a portion of the gospel because they're rejecting parts. Which parts? Well, the one I can tell you that so many Latter-day Saint churches reject altogether is that we're all part of the Latter-day Saint movement. I get attacked by people from all sorts of different Latter-day Saint churches saying, you're not really a Latter-day Saint. You're not really a Mormon. You're an apostate because there's no such thing as non-denominational Mormonism. Well, when there's 500 people that I know of, for sure, that believe in you know, or claim to be non-denominational Mormons, and I know that there's way more out there than that. Those are just the people that I've met. Clearly, there's non-denominational Mormons. You can't say that we don't exist. It's like saying that there aren't doors. You may not have doors in your house, but there's still doors. They still exist. And I use that example because doors are something that every house normally has but they can be easily removed and that's really what we non-denominational mormons are many of us came from a church didn't feel the spirit there but knew the book of mormon was true knew that god was real and so we stepped outside of that box so that we could embrace the latter-day saint movement itself this is this is the thing that christy and i talked about that really kind of grabbed us. I mean, we, we, this is really what the crux of the conversation was about, the, the, the pinnacle of it, if you will. If they shall do all these things and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. Now that's an odd statement. Normally, we would expect it to say something like, I will take but the Lord isn't saying that here. He's saying, I will bring it. That means it's something leaving the churches, coming out. Who is coming out of the church? What is coming out of the church? We are. Non-denominational Mormons are leaving these churches. We're leaving the Gentiles to be Israel. Now, I want to step away from this particular scripture for a moment to read a revelation that I received uh, that is canon for the fellowship. And this is where we definitely leave the non-denominationalism, and I apologize. I received a revelation uh, about a month or so before the world found out about COVID. And so it was in November of uh, 2019, and the and November, oh, yeah, November 30th, 2019. And the Lord told me that the days of the Gentile are now past. And in this revelation, starting in verse 20, this, this is Doctrines of the Saints 2G, by the way. And I'm going to read 20 through 26. The Lord says, Who is the house of Israel? Who are my covenant peoples? Notice it's peoples plural, not people. And behold, I say unto thee that these are the people of Israel. These are those of Yashar El, which is Hebrew, the path straight to God. And that Hebrew means straight to God. Okay, one, these are those that will seek my face and not turn from me. Two, these are they that will taste the fruit of the tree of life, and it shall taste sweet, and these shall not turn away. Three, these are they who shall love the Lord their God with all their hearts, minds, and strength. And this they shall show by their love for their fellow man, and their care for the earth and her creatures. Four, these are they that shall do my works, and shall bring to pass the oneness of the heavens and the earth. 
And then he concludes by saying, These are they that to whom I shall say, Well done, my good and faithful servants. So we have this, this window, if you will. And, and I don't think this is night and day. I don't think that every person that is counted as Israel, because we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, is immediately seeking the, the, the face of God and never turning away. We may have our bad days. The thing is that we keep coming back. We keep accepting that Teshuvah. You know, we taste the tree of life. It tastes sweet. Again, we may turn it away, but we come back. Uh, we may not always be perfect in our love of God, but we're striving for it. We're doing the best we can with the strength that we have. And, and it shows by the love we have for one another and the care we take for the earth and our creatures. And then we may not always be doing the Lord's work, but it's on our minds. It is, it is something we actively are pursuing to bring the past the oneness of the heavens and the earth. And then on the other hand, going back to the Book of Mormon, we have the Gentiles. We have Israel and we have Gentiles. It's one of the questions Christian or the, one of the questions Christine asked me yesterday. You know, what's a Gentile? What is Israel? So I'm, I'm bringing up our you know our conversation from last night. The Gentiles are those that sin against the gospel. Maybe not constantly, maybe not in every way, but they do. They reject the fullness of the gospel. They're lifted up in pride and egoism. They think they're better than all nations and all people above the whole earth. They lie. They're deceitful. They're up to no good. They're hypocrites, murderers. They practice priestcraft, whoredoms, and secret abominations. Now, this doesn't mean that every single person that isn't all the way over here is instantly bad. It could just be that there are people that, that are rejecting the fullness in any one of this list. So the reality is that, you know, it, it's, it's a gray area between black and white here. And the question then becomes, as we're growing in grace, are we truly saved so that we're more on this end most of the time? Or are we superficially pretending? In which case we're more over here most of the time. It's, it comes down to what's in your heart. Why are you doing what you're doing? Because we're all imperfect. We're all going to make mistakes. But if we have Israel in our hearts, then the reasons behind what we do are going to be aimed towards that, those four things that the Lord told us in the Doctrines of the Saints. But if our hearts are closed and more towards our egoism and our pride, then we're always going to be, the reasons for what we do are always going to be around, have something to do with the list that Jesus gave us in the Book of Mormon. What does this have to do with anything? Why am I talking about this? Well, a couple of reasons. One, I want you to know that you are called you haven't just decided to leave wherever you are and wander in the wilderness aimlessly. You were called out because this says, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. And I will remember my covenant, which I have made unto my people, O house of Israel. I will bring my gospel unto them. And a lot of people, when they leave their churches, they're confused. What do I do? Where do I go? I've been told my whole life who I'm supposed to be and how I'm supposed to be. Now what? And in, in the fellowship of Christ, we tell you, now is your opportunity to get to know God personally so that you can receive those answers from the Holy Spirit. Joseph Smith did not teach that the church was supposed to be led by the Holy Ghost. That's the first comforter. That's the beginning stage. The call to an apostle your true apostleship, your true calling is known when you have seen the risen Jesus Christ and can testify the world of this fact. You know a true apostle because they are living their life, as Oliver Cowdery said, in such a way that they will be able to see the physical resurrected Jesus Christ. And you can be called as an apostle and be striving, and that's fine, the grace of Christ will cover you 
But true apostleship happens when you've actually had that revelation, when you've actually seen Jesus Christ. And that's not just for apostles that are in a calling of a quorum of apostles. Joseph Smith taught that that's the goal of every Latter-day Saint. All of my life, whenever people ask me, what's the difference between Mormonism and every other religion? I would always say, Christian churches are great. They tell you to follow Jesus Christ. Mormonism is different because we tell you to find him. It's not that you're a doubter like Thomas that has to see him. It's that your faith is so great that you're working towards actually seeing him. And if you know anything about Kabbalah, that is the same, you know, Kabbalah has the same goal. You're doing everything you're doing so that you can reach the orchard, so that you can get back to Eden, so you can walk with God once again. Kabbalah and Mormonism, they are the same thing because they're both trying to lead us back to God literally, not in some metaphysical way. So, back to the Book of Mormon. I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. We are called. I will show unto thee, O house of Israel, that the Gentile... Oh, I'm sorry. I will remember my covenant which I made unto my people, house of Israel, and I will bring my gospel unto them. So we're called out into the wilderness, and there we will receive the gospel. And I will show unto thee, O house of Israel, that the Gentiles shall have no power over you. That sounds familiar. There's a revelation I received that said that if you follow the Lord and you're kicked out of your church, they don't have the power to take away your priesthood. They don't have the power to take away the covenants you've made between you and God. Your baptism is still relevant. Your priesthood power is still active. They don't have power over us anymore after we leave. We are fully in the hands of God. And in this moment, our hearts are open, our minds are open, and we have the ability now to properly receive the fullness of the gospel. And what is the fullness of the gospel? It's love. I know there are people who get sick of hearing me say that, but that's what it is. How do we know we're Israel? Because we love the Lord. Because the things we do show that we love the Lord. We love our fellow man and we care for them. As a sign of who we are. Not because it's something we have to do. But because we can't help it. it it's literally what we're driven to do. It's what we're passionate about. Now, I don't want you to think that there's no hope. I don't want you to think that this is us versus them. Because it says very clearly in verse 38, RAV, verse 13, OPV, if the Gentiles will repent and return unto me, saith the Father, behold, they shall be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. I will not suffer my people who are of the house of Israel to go through among them and tread them down, saith the Father. It's not our job to put these people, these churches, however you want to say that, in their place. That's the Lord's job. We do not judge them. We love them. If they want to pretend like we're enemies, let them. And we will love our enemies just as the Savior taught us to do. I'm not here to condemn the Latter-day Saint churches. I'm here to uplift you with this message. That you are loved. That you are called and that the Lord has a plan for you, and it's prophesied right here in the Book of Mormon, written long before any of us were born. The Lord knew that this was going to happen. He knew. We can't help it as people. We immediately start writing our own creeds, which the Lord told Joseph Smith in his first vision was an abomination before him. And then we immediately start segregating and saying, you can't be with us anymore because you're not following our creeds. You're not following our man-made rules. That's not the fullness of the gospel. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Does that mean that they're wicked, horrible, evil people? No. They're doing the best they can with what they know. And therefore, as Israel, what we know to do is to love them where they are, accept them where they are, and pray for them. As an ecumenical movement, our goal is for all churches to work together as one in Christ. What makes the Fellowship of Christ, the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship so unique? We don't call apostles to go out and do missionary work to raise up the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. No. Apostles are called to help bring the churches back together. That's their mission. Who is it that the apostles were sent to in Jesus' day? The Jews. In the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship, apostles aren't called to go and build up and fill seats in the Fellowship of Christ. They are called to help bring the churches together, to encourage people to work as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City and the Strangite Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Community of Christ, and, 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 and. The 70 are called to help find those that are seeking God and help them organize into congregations, not as the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship, necessarily, but to help these people worship together as saints until they can get to a point to where they can create a high council, which is led by a patriarch and matriarch. And thus we have the four pillars in the fellowship, the first presidency, the apostles, the 70, and once churches are organized, the high councils, the, the patriarchs and matriarchs. And these are all equal. That's why together the leadership of these becomes the council of elders. Now, we're nowhere near any of that. But the Lord has called us out. He's called us out from among them to do this work. He's called you to do this work. We've left Egypt. And by leaving Egypt, I don't mean whatever church. I'm not trying to say that, you know, Whatever church you came from is Egypt, and the leader of that church is Pharaoh. Please don't take it that way. But we've left the worldliness behind. We did that when we became Latter-day Saints in whatever branch we did. We had to wander around in the wilderness. But the Lord did bring us to the mountain of God. And there we did receive the Holy Ghost. And now it's time to come into the promised land as Israel. Satan would tell us it can't be done. Satan would tell us to stand by yourself, to stand alone because the whole world's against us. But God says that we can do this, that we are called, that there is a work to be done so I want to go back to the revelation I received again, section 2G, and I want to ask you, are you seeking the face of God and will not turn away? Have you tasted the goodness of the tree of life, saw that it was sweet and not spit it out? Do you love the Lord your God? with all of your heart, mind, and strength, and naturally show that love by your love for your fellow man and your care for the earth and her creatures. And lastly, and this is, this is the last one to list because I believe it's a, it's a pattern of growth. There's steps that we're taking. Are you willing to do the works of God to bring the past the oneness of the heavens and the earth? Protestants do this thing that they call an altar call. 
And in that altar call, they'll say, anybody that wants to, to come to Christ, it feels the Holy Spirit today, come up here and we'll bless you so you can be saved. Brothers and sisters, the majority of people I've met and I've talked to are seekers because they've already been saved. The problem is just they're having trouble dealing with the demons in their lives, the questions that they have about themselves and the person that their churches have told them they're supposed to be. So I don't really feel impressed by the Spirit to call you to come to Christ. Because if you're listening to my voice, there's a very good chance that you already have been called to Christ. And if you haven't, then please come and see. But those that have, my altar call, if you will, today is come and do. I testify to you this day that I will do this work of the Lord for the rest of my life. I am setting things up right now so that when it's my time to go, all of the things that the Lord has instructed me to do will not be forgotten. I've heard of too many prophets and prophetesses that their families burnt their revelations, destroyed their things after they died. That's not going to happen when I die. The Lord will be able to call someone else to come and take over. To make sure that his work will be done because this isn't my work. But if there's a chance that this work can be done in my lifetime, if you've been called to assist in seeing this work be accomplished, If you've come and you like what you see, then my call to you today is come and do. The Lord needs you. This is his work and we are doing it for his glory. We're not doing this to tear down anyone or anything, but to build up people just like you. People who have been let down or let go or kicked out, whether literally or emotionally from their churches. At this point, you should know that you're not alone. But I hope that today, in the scriptures I've shared with you, in this message, you've seen that you're not only not alone, but you're called, that you're needed, that you're welcome here, and that there is a work to be done. I believe that every person that is born is called to a work. And yes, the scriptures say that many are called and few are chosen. If we don't step forward and acknowledge our calls and work together in Christ, then the works that the Lord has given us cannot be accomplished. So I will say it one last time, come and do. That's my message this Sabbath and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community worshiping Jesus Christ through God's word, the sacrament, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. 
O God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son, and witness unto Thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of Thy Son, and always remember Him, and keep His commandments which He hath given them, that they may always have His Spirit to be with them. Amen. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of Thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto Thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember Him, that they may have His Spirit to be with them. Amen. Thank you for sharing your time with us to worship so that we can worship together as one in Christ. I do ask that you please share this video as you feel impressed and moved by the Spirit to do so, so that others will have the opportunity to hear these words and know that they're not alone. And that there is a work being done in the name of Jesus Christ. That all those that feel called to something may be a part of. I'm now going to offer a closing prayer. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads at this time to thank you for all of your blessings all of the opportunities that you provided us for the technology so that we can speak mouth to ear and also for your Holy Spirit so that we can speak spirit to spirit. We thank you for the restored gospel of Jesus Christ that you've given us through the prophet Joseph Smith and others. We thank you for the revelations that we've received to help us know that we're not alone and that you do have a plan for us. We thank you for the grace that your son Jesus Christ provides for us to make up for our inadequacies and offer us a way home so that Teshuvah is available to all. We ask you to please soften the hearts of those that would fight against us, that they will see thy spirit in us as we move forward in faith. We ask you to please soften our spirits and strengthen us as we do our best to love all Latter-day Saints and strive for unity of the saints, that we may be one in purpose, even if we are not all one in theology. We thank you for the scriptures that help us to know your words, but more importantly, the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand them. We pray that all those that have been called will hear this message today and feel it, that they will know of a surety of their calling from thee and their part in this work. And if it is not time yet for your words and your works to go forth, then we ask that you please preserve the things that we are doing and protect them to ensure that when your time is right, that all things will be done in a way that is pleasing unto you. All of this is done for you and in your name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Unto you is the glory and the honor. And we thank you for the privilege that you bless us with, that we may have a small part in your works. Help us to know your will to be Israel to a greater capacity, to shine true love from us, the true light of Christ, because of who we are, because of who you transformed us back into our true selves, who we've always been eternally and always will be eternally, so that your love and your light and your gospel can light up the whole earth, all of creation, so that the heavens and the earth can again be one. 
We thank you again for all your blessings. We pray these things to you humbly. In the name of your beloved Son, even Jesus Christ, so mote it be. Amen.